If I can't keep my head held high enough, I'll just speak love and watch the smiles come. Bring my spirits up. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still know that I'm blessed. Next, we have the Governor's Mansion, built in 1909. The land cost was only $10. There was 30 years of debate related to the Governor's Mansion. Nevada became a territory in 1861 and a state in 1864, but there was no Governor's Mansion until 1909. The Governor and their family members had to find lodging where they could. Reno architect George A. Ferris designed the mansion. The construction bid was only $22,700. Here it describes the building's features. It's a large home and on a nice piece of land you can see in the clip here. Okay, appreciate your gardeners and landscapers. We're going by the Governor's Mansion of Colorado. We were here a long time ago. This is awesome. Hopefully the sun's not blasting not too much. Yeah, so this is the Governor's Mansion. Is that beautiful or what? And the security is so, like, minimal. Can you go teeny bit up? It's so hard. We noticed last time we were here that the security is, like, so minimal. You could just, like, literally, if you were psycho, the door's, like, right there. And we could get out and walk, but I'm even nervous to do it. It was last time too. Is that the Ferris wheel guy's house? No, no. I feel like it was a cream color. There's some really pretty houses all around here too. The man that invented the Ferris wheel that uh, was around here. What a pretty house, huh? Actually, we didn't go this way last time. We came in this area. We just went around the other side. And beautiful gardens. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, we didn't see this side last year when we were in these parts. Look at the little dollhouse back there too. It's like the same. It's like the mansion. Like a mini. Yeah, sorry guys. It's too hard to defend. We're not from Nevada, so I apologize. I don't know the governor's um, name. I have seen it around, and I know he seems to be a popular guy. I have noticed some things about Nevada that are different than where we come from. Look at that cool house. I feel like guns, guns are definitely, it's, it's a very... Uh, Gun friendly? Respected and revered. Guns make me nervous, but anytime any rights are taken away, whatever they are, that makes me more nervous. I don't want this to be about gun rights. Oh, this house is beautiful. That is United States citizens. The rights, is, the rights are what we need to keep and not the rights are what people fight for. So don't give your rights up too easy, whatever the rights are. Oh, there's some really nice houses back here in the little park. Okay, I'm going to sign out until we figure out where the uh, Ferris wheel person's house is. But you can see these are all gorgeous historical houses all through back here in Carson City. Next, we have the Stewart House, built in 1887, owned by William M. Stewart, who was a U.S. Senator. He left the Senate in 1875 and then came back in 1886 and represented Nevada for the next 18 years. He took the lead on passing mining laws and wrote the 15th Amendment. You can see other facts regarding Mr. Stewart. He was a very important person. In 1915, 
Susan M. Hayes bought and operated Hayes Hospital out of the home. It was only a three-bedroom hospital. Here are a few more beautiful homes in the area that really caught our eye. Here is the beautiful county courthouse built during the 1920s. It's just a magnificent, stunning building. Here's one of many antique shops in the area. This is the brewing company built in 1865. It was Nevada's first brewery. A brewery and bar was downstairs and a Masonic Lodge upstairs from 1864 until 1916. They used it as their lodge hall. The brewery was known for their specialty steam beer, which is made from the pure, clear water from Kings Canyon Creek nearby. In 1863, they made 90 barrels and every barrel sold within just one month's time. It was a great year for business. They ended up selling over 500 barrels at $3 per gallon. That's quite a bit of money for back in that time. Next we have the pretty little church, St. Peter Episcopal Church, built in 1868. It was built for a cost of only $5,500. Here's a few more houses that caught my eye. I don't know the history, but they are worth including here. Next is the Yarrington House, built in 1863. It's an elegant home with imported marble fireplace and a solarium, with arched windows reminiscent of a railroad observation car. Next is the Cavell House, and once again, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing correctly, I'm doing my best. This house was built in 1907, and it's one of two homes like this in the city. It was considered advanced design for the times, with low ceilings, gas and electric fixtures, and a hot water heater. William Henry Cavell was a leading dentist in the city from 1896 to 1952. He was born 9-11 of 1869 in Carson City. When he was seven years old, the family moved to Modesto. In 1895, he graduated from the University of California School of Dentistry. He went back to Carson City and continued to practice there for 50 years. That's a pretty cool story. I also like this house. I like the color of the home and the porch. Next was one of my favorite houses. I could actually imagine living there. This is the Norcross house, built in 1906, built by Frank Norcross. He became a lawyer and a district attorney, and he was also on the Supreme Court of Nevada in 1904. He was on the Supreme Court for 12 years before he went back to private practice. And in 1928, President Coolidge appointed him as a judge to the U.S. State District Court. That's pretty impressive. He died in San Francisco November 4th of 1952. There was also another Supreme Court judge who owned this home for a time. History is so fascinating. Here we have the Schultz House built in 1864. It was sold in 1878 for $4,000 and then again sold in 1884 for $1,600. The Schultz family kept the home for 100 years. This is an interesting building, the United Methodist Church, built in 1865. Reverend Nims hauled sandstone blocks from the state prison for two years building this. The prisoners quarried it and squared the stone. He single-handedly hauled it and laid the stones by himself. It's a Gothic stone revival building, has been added to on over the years, and the sanctuary is still in use. I'm so impressed by Reverend Nims and his dedication to the Lord through his preaching and his labors to make this beautiful church which still stands today. Way to go, Reverend Nims. 
finally, we get to the Ferris house. The one I was looking for. We've seen it before, but it's just fascinating. The house was built in 1863 by the inventor of the Ferris wheel. It makes sense why Shields, the amazing store we went to, has an indoor Ferris wheel and a history display featuring the Ferris wheel. By the way, be sure to watch that episode. The store will blow your mind. We wish California had a Shields store. Actually, the home is referred to as the Sears Ferris House. George Washington Gale Ferris Sr. bought the building from the Sears family. It's a square frame building 60 feet by 60 feet, combining styles of Greek, Gothic Revival, and Classical Revival influences. Ferris came to Nevada in 1864. He farmed typical crops. He was unique as he also planted numerous tree varieties and was responsible for importing large numbers of eastern ornamental trees to Carson City, such as hickory, black walnut, and chestnut. Many of his trees can still be seen at the beautiful Capitol grounds. We've explored these grounds before. They're phenomenal. We weren't able to do it this time, but we do highly recommend that you visit the impressive state capitol grounds in Nevada. The buildings are also gorgeous there. Here are some interior shots showing the features of the building. George Ferris was born in 1859. He graduated from military school in Oakland, California, and went on to Polytechnic Institute, where he earned his engineering degree. By the year 1892, he was a bridge builder and an organizer of his own company in Pittsburgh. American engineers were challenged to build something to rival the Eiffel Tower for the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. One Saturday, George was sitting in a chop house. By the way, I looked that up to make sure I knew what it was, and it is a place that specializes in steaks and chops, mainly meat. Uh, designation in North America. So that Saturday he came up with an idea and immediately wrote it down right on the tablecloth. He came up with the idea for the Ferris wheel. It towered 250 feet with 36 cars each, large enough for 40 people. It was a hit right away. It took 20 minutes to make a complete revolution. Family descendants believe George's idea came from his early days in Nevada, watching the big wheel turn near the Mexican mill on the Carson River. Running without a hitch through the exhibition, an estimated one and a half million riders at 50 cents each rode the Ferris wheel. Later, owners of resorts like Coney Island stole George's idea. There's so many stories like this in history, it makes me so angry. Like the boysenberry, which came from Napa, but was claimed by Knott's Berry Farm. You should look into that. It's a fascinating story. You'd be shocked. George also felt robbed by the exhibition, too, of the $750,000, which is the profit from his wheel. He spent the next two years in litigation. He owed the suppliers and investors, and the fair owed him. He was bankrupt when he died prematurely in 1896 of typhoid fever at only 37 years old. Just think what he could have gone on to do. At least his name lives on in the observation wheels of the world's Ferris wheels. The Ferris wheel was dismantled and rebuilt in Lincoln Park, Chicago. In 1895, it was dismantled and rebuilt a third and final time for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri. Ultimately, it was demolished in 1906. In 2007, the 45-ton axle was discovered near where it was demolished. Now we move on to the first Presbyterian church built in 1864. The brick building is considered to be the oldest Presbyterian church and service in the state of Nevada. What a beautiful building. Next we have the Abraham Curry House built in 1871. It doesn't look like much, but Boy, there's so much history related to this house and Abraham Curry himself. I went down another rabbit hole, so come along with me. The Curry House is built from sandstone, quarried from the Nevada State Prison. Originally, the house had an octagonal dome 
which served as a dining room skylight. Also, a front porch of five bays in front of the projecting front pavilion, which returned against the walls of the main block. To be honest with you, I had a hard time deciphering that. If you know architecture, you'll probably have a better idea of what that means. <laughs> he had an incredible life. It was amazing all the things that he did. Curry was one of the founders of Carson City. He was born in 1814 in New York. He came to Carson County in 1858, and within one year, in 1859, he located a claim on the Comstock load. Later, it was incorporated as part of the Gould and Curry Mine. From 1862 to 1864, he was the warden and contractor for Nevada Territorial Prison. He was also a territorial assemblyman from 1862 to 1863, a territorial senator from 1863 to 1864, county surveyor from 1866 to 1869, superintendent of construction of the U.S. Mint in Carson City from 1869 to 1871. Please see the episode one of the Kit Carson Trail for Mint History and the Museum episode where we toured the museum in the Mint Building, including the 1870 Mint Machine. He died October 19, 1873, at only 58 years old. His funeral was the largest of its time. The Mint even ceased operations for the day in respect for its first superintendent. He's buried in Lone Mountain Cemetery. Mr. Curry's wife claimed he only had one dollar in his pocket when he died in 1873 of a stroke at only 58 years old. In 1964, a granite marker was placed at his grave. Here you can see the magnitude of the marker. Also notice the Freemason symbol. Mr. Curry's last major local job was the V&T Carson City Shops. Those were the railroad machine shops. Speaking of V&T Railroad and the Freemasons, here is the former train station for Carson City. The tracks used to run right down Washington Street by the side of what is currently the Masonic Lodge. The railroad closed in 1950. In 1953, the Masons purchased the building directly from the V&T Railroad. Note, Lodge Number 1 distinction. It's the first Freemasons Lodge in Nevada dating back to 1862. Even Mark Twain visited there. He signed the record, which they still have today. Remember the brewing company earlier in this episode? The building that also housed the Mason Lodge from 1864 to 1916? They also have a commemorative plaque at this building. It also houses an awesome little coin shop. The owner is very knowledgeable and friendly. We bought some unique coins from him. He knew a lot about the history. We recommend his coin shop. Next is this little yellow house. It's so cute. It's designated the Foreman Roberts House. It's a museum. It was built in 1863. It is Gothic Revival style. It was originally built in Old Washoe City, Utah Territory. And in 1867, it was sold. And in 1874, it was moved all the way to its present location in Carson City, Nevada. In 2017, it was even the annual Christmas ornament. The second owner of the home, James D. Roberts, fought in the 1860 Pyramid Lake Indian War. I had to know more about this Indian War. It's so fascinating to me how we've painted history in our favor, regardless of the truth, which is still a big problem today, 162 years later. When will we ever learn? In my research, I discovered the Paiute War, a.k.a. Pyramid Lake War, also known as Washoe Indian War, was a conflict between armed northern Paiute, Shoshone, and Bannock tribes. The tribes fought against settlers supported by U.S. military forces. July 1859, settlers poured into the region. They had no regard for natives as people. The settlers took whatever they wanted. 
water, feed, land, etc. The Pony Express showed the same disregard. Conflict became inevitable. On May 7, 1860, the war was kicked off when an old Paiute man with a young woman went to a home of J. O. Williams. Four white men tied the man up and attacked the young woman. They were eventually set free, but the man returned later. He forced the four white men into the house and burnt it to the ground with the men still inside. The Paiutes claimed victory when they defeated U.S. Major William Ormsby's forces in Nevada. But the natives eventually lost the war. After that, there was still no peace. May 21st, 1860, the Pony Express station keeper was killed and the station was burned at Simpson Park. June of 1860, services were canceled between Carson City, Nevada and Salt Lake City, Utah due to the, all the unrest. Watch the smiles come. Thanks for watching. My spirits up. Don't forget to stop and smell the flowers. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still know that I'm blessed.